Hi, good morning everyone and welcome to our Easter Sunday service. Hope you're all tuning in online or wherever you are, in your bedrooms, in your kitchen, in your living room. Let's spend some time praising God.
situation you're facing, you feel like you're looking into an empty tomb. You're looking at a situation that seems hopeless. What's going to happen to my job? What's going to be happening to my family? What, who's going to put food on the table? What's the future of our country? Like, what's the future of the economy? What's my future going to look like? The, the, this one thing I was hoping on to, to get me through this is gone. The person I was hoping to help me with this is no longer available. And you feel that everything has crashed down around you. And you may be like Mary, in deep grief, in deep turmoil. But let's be people who take a second look at it. And as we do, let's recognize that there is a bigger picture. Yes, things may have changed. Yes, your life may not seem to be what you're expecting it to be at this moment. But look with eyes of faith. Look at the bigger picture. Why are you weeping, Jesus says, not knowing that the one that she was looking for was alive. Jesus Christ was not dead in the same your life may look like shambles, it may look confusing, you may be out of sorts and you may be going through whatever amount of pain. Look at the bigger picture. Fix your eyes on the victory already at hand. Jesus Christ died for our sin. He paid the price for our condemnation and He's not dead. He is alive. There is hope for your situation because Jesus lived. There is resurrection power because we don't worship a good teacher we don't worship someone who's knowledgeable a miracle worker we're worshiping a savior who died and rose again and that brings hope therefore my question to you this morning is the same why are you weeping who are you looking for if you're looking for the government to set things right and you're looking in the wrong places you're looking for your spouse to get it right you're looking in the wrong places you're looking for your kids to bring you home you're looking in the wrong places. Look to Jesus. He is your Redeemer. He is your salvation. He is our very present help in time of need. And I love this portion of scripture that when, when, when Mary looks to, to, to whom she thinks is the garden of Jesus reveals himself not by telling Mary who he was but by telling her who she was to him. Mary, he calls her. Let me tell you today, God knows you by name. He's not here to explain everything to you, not interested in some deep theological debate. He's here to say, hey, I see you. Hey, I know you. I know the anguish you're going through. I know the things are confusing in your life, but know that I see you and I love you. I died and I rose again victorious. I am right now interceding for you. This is a reality right now. Jesus is in heaven praying for you, interceding for you. He calls you by name, He sees you, dear friend. Let there be hope that rises to give. Hope in resurrection power that is alive in you, that is alive in your circumstances. That God truly is working all things out for our good. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's continue to worship. Let's continue to praise God. Let's lift our hands. Stand to your feet. Begin to worship Him. He is God who all things are possible. Begin to see that God is
If you have your bread in your cup with you, let's partake of communion right now before we close. Father, we thank you for the bread we hold in our hand that represents your broken body, broken so that we can be made whole. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for the supernatural, supernatural healing power that flows through faith in what you have done. We receive right now healing for our bodies, for our minds, for our relationships. You were whipped, you were scourged so that we can be healed. We receive right now healing. Father, we thank you for the cup we hold in our hand that represents your spilled blood. Spilled so that we can be forgiven. You were punished so that we can receive the blessing of God so that we can stand in righteousness, so that we can be stand in freedom. Thank you, God, for forgiveness of every sin. We partake right now of the bread and the cup and you may partake of the bread and the cup, church. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So good it is to celebrate our resurrected Savior in this beautiful morning. We hope that you are doing well. We're going to continue to partake in our giving right now and encourage you, especially during this season, to have eyes of faith, to be strong in the Lord and continue to give. And I believe that as you sow, especially in this season, that God would honor your faith, that He would multiply seed to the sower, that He would bless and increase all of your barns would be filled to overflowing during this time that we would be a people who knows what it is to be a blessing to others during this time. Amen. And the number, bank account number is on the screen. God bless you, church. Have a great week again. Hey, beautiful people of Destiny C3, friends and family. So good to be able to connect with you again on this Sunday. Not just a regular Sunday, but this is a Resurrection Sunday. We are going to be celebrating Easter and what an Easter it is going to be. Uh, this is our first Easter Sunday where we will be celebrating remotely from the comforts of our homes, our, our rooms, wherever we are. And let's make it a celebration to remember. Uh, if you're with your families, listen, celebrate with your families. If you're alone, celebrate with Jesus. He is with you. You're not alone, really. Ultimately, we are celebrating Him. It is about Jesus. Yes, we are confined to our houses, but we are blessed regardless. There's so much going on in our lives right now for us to give thanks to God about, you know. So we are still blessed regardless of what's happening in, in the natural you know, I saw some posts on social media comparing this, this lockdown to Noah's situation when his family and him had to be locked in an ark for 40 days and 40 nights. And we, we need to thank God that our lockdown is nothing like what Noah's lockdown was. You know, Noah was stuck in a place with one window and, uh, and for light and ventilation. He was in lockdown with a whole bunch of animals. Imagine that being stuck in a confined space with a whole bunch of animals. You know, some of you are probably saying, hey, pastor, if you know the family members that I live with, you know, uh, uh, you, I can totally relate to what Noah went through. Listen, it's not the same case at all. Anyway, speaking of Noah, this Easter, I want to take this opportunity to share a message of Easter from the life of Noah. Some of you may have watched the movie Noah that was released some years ago and now is on Netflix. Uh, many people got excited because it seemed like Hollywood was educating people on the Bible and that alone was a huge breakthrough. That was great news. Well, at least that's what I thought until I actually watched the movie and I was horrified, really, really horrified. The movie had as much to do with the reality of the Bible as chocolate bunnies has to do with Easter. To say that they took some artistic liberties is an uh, understatement for sure. In fact, they rewrote the entire character of Noah. They rewrote God in the story. The only similarity between, between Noah in the movie and Noah in the Bible was that it was, there was a flood and there was a boat. Everything else was crazy. Noah was crazy. The people of the time were crazy. God was crazy. So anyway, going back to the story of Noah... Here's a bit of a backstory. I'm sure most of you know this story, but just to refresh you, this was the early days of mankind where mankind started to multiply on the earth and because of that, 
all that was going on and what had happened through Adam, the sin and evil also started to multiply on the earth. So the earth and mankind had become something that was so far from the plan, the heart and the desire of God for His people. They had drifted away from God, from their original purpose. And then it, it leads us to this particular point in history that you can read about in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. You know, have you ever had a moment in your life where you regretted something? And we see this point in history where where God expresses or God feels regret. How is it possible that God can feel regret? I mean, God is all-knowing. He knows the beginning from the end. He knew what was going to happen uh, when sin entered the, uh, entered the earth. He knew this was going to happen. So why was He feeling regret? How was He able to feel regret? Yes, He knew. Yes, He is an all-knowing God. But the knowledge of something and the experience of something brings about two different realities. God knows, but God also feels. Jesus knew that He was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But the scripture says that Jesus wept. It's like a parent or a, or a father at the wedding of, a, of the child, a mom and dad at the wedding of their daughter, let's say. I mean, you know your child is getting married, you know the husband is a great guy, and, and you plan, you help plan and prepare for the wedding. But when you see your child walk down that aisle to make those vows, you're crying. Not because you didn't know this was going to happen, because you are feeling, you are experiencing what is happening. So in this, area, in this story, we see the reality of what God is feeling in spite of what He knows. So in the midst of all of that, all that was going on, in the midst of all the evil that, had, that was taking place in the earth at that point in history, we read about this one man. In verse 8, it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then that scripture goes on to share with us about the genealogy of, of, of Noah. And, and it says, Noah walked with God. He was perfect in his generation. He was a just man. And God reveals to Noah his plan. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to wipe out the earth uh, with a great flood. But Noah, you and your family are going to be saved. You, your children, your, you, your wife, your children, their, your sons, their wives, they are all going to be saved. But here's what you need to do. This is my plan plan for your salvation, you need to build this huge boat. You need to build this huge ark and this is how you need to build him. God gives him very detailed plans on how this boat needed to be and needed to be built, how big it had to be, how many levels, how many doors, how many windows, everything. The entire blueprint is given to Noah and says, Noah, you need to build this boat and this boat is your salvation plan. Now, why am I sharing about Noah and the boat this Easter? Because I believe that in this story are three realities that is at the heart of the gospel message, at the heart of the message of the Easter weekend. It is interesting for us to take some points from this story because in Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, in the New Testament, Jesus says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It's talking about the second coming of Jesus. Our time for us. It says the earth will basically be similar to how the earth was when Noah walked the earth. There will be similarities. People would not heed the warnings and pleas of God to come to God, to get, to get back to the truth. And there was, there was a judgment that was coming. So here's the problems of Noah's day. 
First, it was the sinful state of mankind. As I mentioned, there was hopelessness. Everyone was corrupt beyond redemption. You know, God was grieved. He regretted that He created man. People were not just bad. It says that they, they were, their hearts were evil continually. That means there was no interval or, or no pause in their evil intent and evil thoughts. It was continuously evil. You know, have you ever spoken to someone who was continuously talking? I'm sure most of you have, and I have for sure. They continuously talk. They don't even stop to catch a breath. And there's almost no opportunity for you to, to interject and say something, to, to interrupt them or, or try to get your point of view in. And that's pretty much what this is like. It says the hearts of the people were evil continually. It was like there was no opportunity. There was no gap of goodness that God could get in and interject and, and bring His plan and speak to them and, and cause their hearts to turn. It was evil continually. Mankind was lost in sin. There was also a contamination or a corruption in the bloodline of man. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, it says there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. The sons of God in the Old Testament always refers to angels. And he talks about these heavenly beings, these fallen angels being attracted to the daughters of men, leaving their places to be with these daughters of men. And so there was also a biological corruption that was prevalent at that time. And it says because of that, giants were born. Giants were, there were giants in the earth at that point. So God, reached, God was reaching out to these people through Noah. Second Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 5, it says, God saved Noah, one of eight people, and describes Noah like this. He was a preacher of righteousness. That means Noah was God's mouthpiece, God's voice to that generation. Come to God. Come to God. Come back to righteousness. Save yourselves. God wants you to repent. Turn from your evil ways. Come to God. But mankind was unable to break themselves free from the growth and the influence and the effect of sin. Basically, mankind was broken and unable to fix themselves. They could not find their way or they didn't, they didn't even have the desire to find their way back or want to come back to God. And they drifted further and further away. And because of this condition, these people was headed towards another problem. So there, there was a problem of sin, but sin will always lead to judgment. So we see the sinful state of men and we see the coming judgment because of the situation, because of the wickedness of men not wanting to repent, God finally decides to bring judgment on the earth. That's the natural progression. Sin was going to bring judgment. In Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20, it says, The soul who sins shall die. In Romans chapter 6 verse 23, it says, The wages of sin is death. So in this story, we see the hopeless situation that mankind is in. We see that judgment is going to come. There's the problem of sin and there's the penalty of sin that was coming. But even in that situation, we see the heart of God. We see God's goodness and grace reaching out where He makes a way out. He makes an escape plan for those who are willing to trust in Him in this time. And this was God's salvation plan. Yes, my judgment is coming, but I'm going to make a way for you to escape, Noah, you and your family. You see, between mankind and the judgment for our sins is God's escape plan. God's plan for your salvation. Contrary to what many people think or believe, God is not waiting to punish people. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, it says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He desires all men, not some men, all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, he said, He is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. In John 3, 17, for God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might 
be saved. So between man's guilt, man's inability to, to save himself from the effects of sin and the coming judgment, God made a way. God had a salvation plan. In Noah's time, God's plan was a huge boat, an ark that was going to protect those inside from the flood, the God's judgment that was coming in the form of a flood so that those in the ark would be safe and protected from God's wrath. And that episode in Scripture is actually pointing to a coming reality that was going to one day stand between mankind and the coming judgment at the end of days. As the ark was God's plan to save people from the judgment that was coming in Noah's day to deliver them into the new life, into a new earth, the cross was God's plan to save you and I from eternal separation from God, from eternal punishment, and to one day deliver us into a new heaven and a new earth. John 3.16, the scripture we are all familiar with, it says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. He will certainly save you and I from God's condemnation. Jesus is to you and I. Jesus is to mankind at this point of time and generation what the ark was to Noah and his family at that point in history. Jesus is our hope in a hopeless situation. And how does Noah get God's salvation plan? How does he become a part, an heir of God's salvation plan? A few pointers from the story of Noah. Like I mentioned, the story starts off by telling us how evil everyone is. But then in the midst of all the description of how bad the earth was at that point of time, we read this verse in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 that says, But Noah... Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the midst of all that was going on, all the evil, everyone turning their backs on God and His ways, there was this one man, Noah, who found grace in the eyes of God. And it goes on in verse 9 to describe uh, Noah. Why did he find grace in the eyes of God? He says this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Why did Noah found, find grace? It says he was just, he was perfect in his generation and he walked with God. You know, when we read the word perfect, we can get a bit intimidated, but the original Hebrew text, uh, uh, this word is actually translated from the Hebrew word, tamim. And its basic meaning is complete, entire. It does not mean perfect, as how we would uh, kind of uh, interpret it today as being without fault and sinless or without defect. In fact, other English words that translate stumming better are these words like whole. Noah was whole. Noah was, was well-rounded, balanced, sound, sincere, innocent, wholehearted. It doesn't mean that Noah was without fault. It doesn't mean that he never sinned, but it says, but it actually is describing him as being someone who, whole, who had a wholehearted, healthy relationship with God. He walked with God. He trusted in God, uh, in God in that time among a people who never looked to God. Noah lived counter-cultural. In a world where everyone was living a certain way, making certain types of decisions, Noah made a choice to live a life that was pleasing to God. And because of that, he found favor in the eyes of God. Today, you and I as believers are called to live our lives counter 
cultural, in a culture that tells you, hey, premarital sex is normal. Affairs are part of marriages. Pornography is okay. Corruption is okay. It's part of our culture. Cursing and swearing is cool. You know, God is not so important. It doesn't matter. You and I here are meant to live countercultural to what the world is saying to us. We need to show the world that there are different standards and there are better standards. There is a different culture that we can live in and, and, and it works. And not only does it work, it brings about the favour of God over our lives. We are called to influence the culture, not be influenced by the culture. The church is meant to be that different voice in this time, in this culture. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about the organization, the building. The scripture says you are the church. The church is the called out ones. We are the called out ones. We are the ones that Jesus has called out to be a part of His kingdom. We are ambassadors of the kingdom. We live by the principles and the laws and, and, and the beauty of the kingdom of God. And it works. A Christian is meant to be a thermostat, not a thermometer. A thermometer reflects the atmosphere, tells you the atmosphere. A thermostat in a room doesn't reflect the atmosphere, it changes the atmosphere. Be a thermostat in your relationships, uh, uh, with your friends, with your family, in your school, in your home right now, in this time that we are living, be a thermostat for God. So because of Noah, because he lived his life a certain way, because he lived his life counter-cultural, because he was right with God and had a good relationship with God, it says he found favour with God in a time where everyone was evil and God was going to judge people for their sins. So God makes a way for him to escape the judgment that was coming. Not just him, but his entire family. His sons, his daughter-in-laws, they all escaped judgment because Noah found favour with God. Because he, God saw him as just, perfect, and because he walked with God. Here's a point to note. It doesn't say that his wife or his sons were just or perfect or his daughter-in-laws were just or perfect. But because Noah walked with God, because God saw Noah as just and perfect, because Noah was right with God, all those who belonged to him received the favour of God that flowed in and through his life. They were all saved because of Noah. So Noah's family inherited their salvation. And just like Noah's family inherited their salvation, their, their, their place on the boat, not because of anything they did, but because Noah was right with God, we too are called heirs of salvation, not because of anything we had done, but because of what Jesus did and because we belong to Him. Today, you and I will not have to face punishment or judgment, not because we are perfect in any way. Today, you and I are saved because we belong to the One who is perfect, who is right in the Father's eyes. Perfection is not a requirement, but faith in Jesus' perfection is required. Trust in Him is required. Noah lived his life a certain way. Therefore, he found favour with God. Today, you and I, we make that decision to live our lives a certain way because we have found favour with God. We, Noah lived for favour. We live from Favor. We have the favor of God upon our lives, not because of anything we had done, but because of what Jesus Christ had already done and because we put our faith in Him. So God's salvation plan. God tells Noah to build an ark. And I want to compare God's salvation plan to the salvation plan that you and I have today. The ark had only one way in. One door, one entrance. There was only one way that you were going to get in that boat, get in the ark. The ark was going to be their refuge from the storm, their place of safety. It was going to be a place of provision. But there was only one way in, one way, one door to get into the ark. God's salvation plan for you and I has only one door. In John chapter 10 verse 9, Jesus says, I am 
the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Jesus is the door through which we enter into God's salvation plan for us. It is, not, it is only through Christ that we can get to that place where we will be free from judgment. John 14 verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ is the door. Another thing about the ark, all their needs were met in the ark. The ark wasn't only there to protect them from the flood. It contained everything that was necessary for them. The ark wasn't only a boat to keep them afloat. It contained all that they needed. It was a place of rest. It was a place that they were going to be provided for. There was enough food and provision in the ark to meet their needs. They lacked nothing in the ark throughout that time. Our salvation is in Christ is not only something that meets our spiritual needs. It says we, He has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. As His divine power has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness, spiritual needs and the needs that we have in life through the knowledge of Him who called us by His glory and virtue. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. It says, And the same God who takes care of me, Paul writes, will supply all your needs from His glorious riches which He has given us in Christ Jesus. God is not only interested in your spiritual well-being, the victory and blessings in Christ are not only meant for you to enjoy one day when you go to heaven, it is for you to live and lay hold of today. He is your ever present help in time of need. If you have a need right now, listen, you are in Christ and in Christ all your needs will be met. And then there was that invitation. When the ark was ready, God gives the invite in Genesis chapter 7 verse 1. He said, the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household. Come into this place of safety, this place of protection, this place of peace. Come into this place of rest where you don't have to fear and worry anymore. In Matthew chapter 11, uh, verse 28, we hear a similar invitation. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that same invitation has gone out throughout the centuries, billions of time. The, the same invitation that Jesus made, come to me, I will be your refuge, I'll be your rest, is that same invitation that has flowed out to the, to the mouths of men throughout history, inviting people into the safety, the protection, the comfort of God's salvation plan for their lives. Acts chapter 16 verse 31. It says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be saved. You and your household. Today God is giving you and I that same invitation. If you are watching me right now and you want to go through that door into God's salvation, into God's peace, if you are uncertain today that if you were to leave this world, if your life were to end today, where you would end up, where would I end up, what will happen to me, if you're uncertain about this, listen, don't wonder or fear or worry anymore. Get into God's plan for your life. Say yes to Jesus. God seals them into the boat. They were sealed by God. Verse 16, And those who entered, male and female, of all flesh, went in as God had commanded them, and the Lord shut him in. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, It's in Christ that you, once you heard the truth and believed it, for your salvation found yourselves home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. God has sealed you with His Holy Spirit. Spirit. The moment you believe in Christ, the moment you walk through that door, God seals you in. Your salvation is sealed in Christ. Your status now is in Christ. Come on, say it right where you are. I am in Christ. Tap the person next to you. If you're sitting with someone next to you, listen, say, I am in Christ. You are in Christ. We are blessed in Christ, delivered in Christ. Saved in Christ, transformed in Christ. We rule and reign in Christ. We are healed 
In Christ, we are forgiven. In Christ, I am the righteousness of God. In Christ Jesus, I am more than a conqueror. In Christ Jesus, that's our status. We are in Christ. Right now, you are in Christ when you enter through that door. But what if you fail? What if I fail? What if we fall? And we all have moments in our life where we stumble and we fall in our walk with God. I'm sure those in the ark stumbled and fell at points, at different points of their, their journey. But here's the thing to note. They, they, they fell, they, even when they fell, they didn't fall and roll out of the ark. They fell, but they fell in the ark. They fell in God's salvation plan. They fell, they got up, and they were still in the ark. That's why the scripture says, though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Righteousness, your righteousness is secure not by what you do, but by where you are. And where are you? You are in Christ. Amen. Noah and his family were in the ark. And God's judgment was poured out. And the ark took the beating, the storms and the waves crashing against it. It faced God's judgment so that those inside could be saved and untouched and unaffected by all that was going on. The ark points to Jesus. The weight of God's judgment fell upon Jesus Christ. He took the beating. He took the punishment so that those who trusted in Him would not have to suffer. He took our punishment so that we would not have to be punished. We would not have to feel the pain of judgment and punishment. He took the curses upon Himself so that you and I would not have to, so that you and I could be walking blessings. He took the stripes upon His body so that you and I could be healed. He was beaten and bruised so that you and I could be made right with God. Jesus is God's salvation plan for you, to save you, to deliver you into the new world. To Noah and his family, the ark kept them and delivered them into a new world. When they came out of it, it was a new world. There was no longer any sin and evil, and at least for a while. In Jesus, we too will one day be delivered into a new heaven and a new earth. One that would last forever. And just as He rose again, we will all rise again. God bless you this Easter. You know, I want to take this opportunity to invite you Today, if you've not given your life to Jesus, if you've not placed your trust in Him, if you're listening to my voice and you're still uncertain that if your number were to be called today, if you were to leave this earth today, you're not sure where you're going to end up. I want to give you this opportunity today to enter, to change your status from unsure to in Christ, to enter into God's salvation plan. Just as Noah and his family entered into God's salvation plan, in those days, you have an opportunity right now to enter God's salvation plan. His salvation plan for you and I is not, is not a boat. It's not made of wood and nails. There was a cross that was made of wood and the nails were used on it. But His salvation plan for you is a person, His name is Jesus Christ. And He is inviting you just as God invited Noah and his family into the ark. He is inviting you this very moment. Come, come to me. If you're tired and heavy laden, I will give you rest. You do not have to face all that you're facing alone. You can face it in Christ. And you've never given your life to Jesus. Today is your opportunity. What greater opportunity, what greater day to give your life to Jesus than on Resurrection Sunday? than to step into His salvation plan. Resurrection, not just Resurrection Sunday, Resurrection Sunday in the year 2020 when we were all remotely watching the service. This is your moment. If you're there, let me pray for you. Why don't you close your eyes, lift your hands to God. Wherever you are, you could be in your room, you could be in your car, you could be watching on your phone somewhere, you could be with your family, and you're not sure about your salvation, this is your moment to be sealed in by God, sealed in Christ by God.
Why don't you repeat after me as we pray this prayer together? Father, we just want to thank you for loving us that much. Lord, we want to thank you for Jesus. We want to thank you for paying that price a lot, for thinking of us even when we were not thinking of you. Lord, for for initiating a great salvation plan so that we do not have to be separated from you, so that we too can be heirs of eternal life and one day stand before your throne in heaven. That even if our number was called today, Lord, we will be with you absent in the flesh and present with the Lord. So Lord, today, Lord, we want to express our faith in Jesus. Come on, in your own words, say, Jesus, I love you and I, I want to trust in you 100%. I want to give my heart and my life to you. I'm tired of living for myself. I want to live for you, Jesus, and I want to trust in your plan for my life, your great salvation. I want to enter that boat. I want to enter in Christ and be saved. Jesus, today I declare you my Lord and my Savior. And I thank you, Lord, that I am saved, not because of anything that I have done, but because of all that Jesus had done. I thank you that my sins are forgiven, washed away by the blood of Jesus. And I thank you that I am no longer separated from God. I am now part of the family of God. Thank you for this salvation. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this Resurrection Sunday. And thank you for all that you're going to do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. And you know, if you've said that prayer for the first time, listen, get in touch with us. If you know someone, uh, a, a Christian that's near you, get in touch with that person. Ask him what to do next. But if you want to be, uh, you want to find out more, you want to be led on this journey, do drop us a, uh, an email at info at destinyc3.com or do get in touch with some of the the friends and uh, family members that are around you who, who belong to this community of faith and we will help you through. God bless you guys. I trust you're going to be having a great Easter Sunday and a great week ahead. We love you, we miss you and look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you. <laughs>